Good day, and welcome to today's Microwaves and RF webinar, Tips for Successfully Integrating and Passing Wireless LAN Regulatory Tests. It's sponsored by Tektronix. I'm Don Toot, and I cover analog and test topics for electronic design. Before we start, a couple of points about today's presentation. Now, if you have any technical difficulties with a console, the first thing to try is function key F5, which will refresh it. Beyond that, you can always click on the yellow help icon below the slides. We welcome your questions during today's event. Type them into the question window on the side of your screen and hit the submit button. No need to wait. It actually helps to get them sorted out during the presentation. We'll answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A that will follow up the, um, and we'll follow up after the conference with the, uh, with email. Today's session is being recorded. It'll be made available on the Microwaves and RF website within the next week. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. You may also download a PDF copy of the slides today by clicking the green folder icon in the toolbar beneath the slides. Let me now introduce today's speaker. Robin Jackman is a senior applications engineer for Tektronix. He's got more than 25 years experience in the industry. He's held a wide variety of positions, including spectrum management, systems design, product development, and regulatory affairs. Robin began his career with the Canadian government after graduating from the microwave technology program at Conestoga College in Ontario in Canada. And so let me turn things over to him. Robin, the floor is yours. Hi, my name is Robin Jackman, and I'm an application engineer with Tektronix. Today we're going to be talking about Wi-Fi pre-compliance measurements. The agenda for today's webinar is as follows. First, we're going to look at Wi-Fi. Second, we're going to look at a basic compliance overview from a regulatory and an industry perspective. Third, take a look at some Wi-Fi pre-compliance testing methods. And finally, review what we learned. The Internet of Things. This is the phrase people are using to describe the connected nature of our world. By some estimates, there, are more, there, are, there were more connected devices than people by about 2009. Some studies have purported that over 2 billion devices will be shipped in 2014. Today, the Internet is being dominated not by devices with a human interface, but devices with a machine interface. And these devices go way beyond personal computers and cell phones. We're talking about thermostats, appliances, pop machines, even beds. Wi-Fi is the primary technology that is driving this trend. IEEE 802.11 is the radio standard behind Wi-Fi. It was initially developed in the late 1997 as a cable replacement technology. 802.11 is now a commodity. There are many drop-in solutions available that will enable Ethernet connectivity for your device. There is no one single answer for which module that you should use in your design. Examine the compromises and select the chipset or integrated module that best suits your needs. If you are selecting a reference design and you're an RF novice, also check to see what kind of integration support may be available from the vendor. Basic Compliance Overview When we talk about Wi-Fi radio compliance, it's important for us to understand the scope of the subject. Wi-Fi is a generic term for wireless fidelity, and there are many different operating modes. Taking a look at the chart here, we can see we have 802.11b, first introduced in 1997, all the way up to 802.11ad, and we can see the various frequency bands that these various standards operate in. This list is by no means definitive, but does represent the most popular modes found today. What makes Wi-Fi compliance measurements more complex is that we need to exercise all of the different operating modes for each one of these standards. And each one of these standards usually has support for a legacy protocol as well. Arguably, Wi-Fi in the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum is the most popular. So let's take a look at that a little further. Not all frequency bands are supported worldwide. Each country has their own say in how a frequency band will be used. The United Nations, through the International Telecommunications Union, helps coordinate frequency bands worldwide. The 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi band is an industrial, scientific, and medical frequency band. These frequency bands are low-power, license-exempt operating areas. There are two general rules for operating in an ISM band. First, devices aren't allowed to create interference to existing services. And second, devices do not receive any protection if they suffer from interference. When used for Wi-Fi, 
The 2.4 gig ISM band has room for 11 channels in North America, but more channels in both Europe and Japan. Remember that the 2.4 gig ISM band is a shared frequency band, so that means there is Bluetooth devices, cordless telephones, and even microwave ovens sharing the same space. From a Wi-Fi perspective, there are several modes of operation in the 2.4 gig band. There's 82.11b mode, where although we have 11 channels available, we have only three clear channels. All of the rest are interstitial. The same thing applies for 82.11g or n mode when we're operating with 20 megahertz occupied bandwidth. If we're operating in 82.11n mode, we have 40 megahertz channels, and that means there's only one clear channel in the 2.4 gig band. If we need to go through the compliance process, we will need to exercise all of these different modes of our radio. All Wi-Fi signals share the same basic structure. Data is packetized and sent in a burst transmission. Each one of the bursts contains a preamble and header, as well as a payload. The preamble and header allow the receiver to synchronize to the transmitter, and the header contains additional information about the payload configuration. The payload itself is where the user's data is transported. The modulation between the header and payload can change, and each burst can have a different payload modulation based on the quality of service. Many of the Wi-Fi modules on the market today are supplied as a certified module. The question is, what type of certification is being supplied? When we talk about certification, we need to examine a product from two perspectives. First, protocol compliance, and second, regulatory compliance. If a module has been offered with regulatory compliance, then the vendor should be able to supply the certification ID as well as a copy of the compliance report. In general, if you make any changes to the RF path at all, changing a switch, an amplifier, or adjusting a matching circuit, then you will need to recertify your product as an intentional radiator. Protocol compliance for the Wi-Fi standard is managed through the Wi-Fi Alliance. The Wi-Fi Alliance is an industry group whose mandate is to ensure that devices with a Wi-Fi interface conform to specific performance levels for interoperability, security, and applications. More information on membership and a list of certified test houses can be found on the Wi-Fi Alliance website. There are three categories of regulatory compliance for devices. Unintentional radiated emissions, which in broad terms means characterizing all of the energy emanating from the device under test. Conducted emissions, which looks at unwanted energy being coupled to the AC mains. And finally, intentional radiated emissions, which pertains to devices which transmit RF energy. As you can see from the table at the bottom, many countries maintain their own regulatory body to administer the rules in their own country. Radiated emissions testing involves placing the equipment under test inside an RF shielded chamber to the influence of other off-air signals. Typically, we place the target device on a turntable so that may, we may rotate the product during the test. At specific azimuths, we use an EMI receiver to scan a range of frequencies, which is dependent upon the class of service of the device. We need to characterize all of the energy emanating from the equipment under test in a 360-degree plane around the device. This test can be very time-consuming depending on the type of scan that has to be done. By comparison, conducted emissions testing is much simpler to measure. We use a LISN or a Line Impedance Stabilization Network to connect the equipment under test to the AC mains. The LISN provides a safe path to couple our EMI receiver to the AC mains so that we can characterize how much noise is being generated by the equipment under test. In general, we're only looking at frequencies less than 30 megahertz during this test. The emission limits are defined by each country and the class of service that the device is intended to be used on, specifically industrial or residential. For devices which transmit RF energy, energy, typically we must ensure that we limit the amount of energy in the adjacent channels. We measure the performance of the transmitter using a spectrum emission mask. In this measurement, the equipment under test is directly coupled to a spectrum analyzer. All of the energy being generated by the equipment under test must fall beneath the levels set out inside the mask. While it's safest to test every frequency or channel that the device will operate on, most test houses will only check the lowest, highest, and mid-frequencies of operation. 
For Wi-Fi specifically, we need to be able to set the transmitter on a specific channel and control its data rate. This table provides a brief comparison of regulations governing WLAN radiators in the 2.4 GHz ISM band. What's important to note is that the regulations are not harmonious worldwide. Test houses provide an important service for us because they will keep track of the re relevant regulations for each specific country. When you take your device to a test house, they will ask you for which country or region that you plan to sell your product so that the appropriate limits can be applied during the testing phase. Given the complexity of the regulatory landscape, it's common for us to use an external test house to measure a product for regulatory compliance. Compliance measurements are costly to set up and perform. They involve calibrated RF environments, specific instrumentation, and of course there's document generation and record keeping. EMI scanning can be time consuming, and a failure in our compliance test means another trip to the test house after we figured out what the problem was. On the other hand, pre-compliance testing can be done in-house. While it's difficult for us to duplicate the setup of a test house, we can make an accurate approximation of our performance before we send the product out. Instruments for pre-compliance testing are much more affordable, and we can do these measurements more often so we can catch a problem sooner in the design process. Even before we get to pre-compliance testing, we need to integrate our Wi-Fi module into our product. This process in itself will raise a number of issues. How is the Wi-Fi module controlled? What are the electrical specifications? Is it a spy bus? Is it an RS-232 bus? What kind of software drivers are required? What is the headroom of our power budget? You know, in other words, how much current does our radio actually need? In general, radios don't like noisy power supplies. How clean is your DC? If the radio doesn't have an integrated antenna, what type of antenna are you going to use? We have been discussing integrating Wi-Fi specifically, but what if our device also incorporates Bluetooth or GPS at the same time? Adding more than one transceiver adds to the complexity of our design, and we end up with more cross-domain troubleshooting issues. We may need to know how our time-domain signals are interacting with our RF modules. Historically, it was not possible to get a signal instrument to make all of these measurements. That was until Tech introduced the mixed-domain oscilloscope. Mixed-domain scopes from Tektronix incorporate an oscilloscope, a logic analyzer, and a spectrum analyzer in a single chassis. But it goes further than that, because the three instruments have a common time base and a common trigger. That means we can trigger the scope and see what's happening on a specific frequency at the same time. Put another way, if we see an EMI event with the spectrum analyzer, we can directly correlate that EMI event with a signal that we are monitoring with the scope or logic analyzer. We can extend the spectrum analyzer features of the MDO4000 with a piece of software called SignalView PC. SignalView PC is vector analyzer software for the MDO. It allows us to see inside our signals and to measure the transmit signal quality. It extends the basic spectrum analyzer features of the MDO by letting us do pre-compliance scans, spectrum emission masks, and even EVM measurements. In simple terms, a vector signal analyzer compares a known signal to a measured signal and then determines the difference between the two. This difference is called error vector magnitude and this value lets us measure the quality of a complex modulated signal. Typically, a lower number is better. The MDO4000 provides a fully calibrated spectrum analyzer capable of characterizing Wi-Fi signals from the basic 802.11b all the way up to 802.11ac. To use SignalView PC with our MDO4000 is very straightforward. We can run the software on a laptop or a tablet and connect to the MDO with an Ethernet or USB connection. When running, SignalView PC takes over operation of the MDO and turns the instrument into a wideband RF capture device. We can connect the Wi-Fi device to the MDO in a number of ways, a direct cable connection, a near-field probe, or even using an isolation chamber. There are some important considerations when preparing the test plan for your product. For regulatory testing, you will need two versions of your hardware, one configured in its shipping format, or the same way your customers will receive the product, and secondly, you need a version of your product which supports a direct connect cable connection to the radio. We also need to be able to directly control the radio mode, meaning we need to be able to set the channel the radio will operate on, which sets up the frequency of operation, we need to be able to control the data rate of the radio, which sets up the modulation type.
And finally, we need to be able to set the radio in a duty cycle as close to 100% as possible. Not only will the test house need this type of control, but all of these things will be very useful during product development. A spectrum analyzer is the basic tool we need for looking at RF signals. Most spectrum analyzers share the same basic display. Low frequency on the left, high frequency on the right, and power logarithmically on the y-axis. A fun fundamental observation is, are we on the right frequency? In this example, we are tuned to channel 6, or a center frequency of 2.437 gigahertz. Here we're looking at an 802.11b signal, and we can tell that much just from looking at the shape of the signal. Unlike a scope, we can't use a simple marker to measure power, but rather we need to measure all of the energy under the curve. Spectrum analyzers have a built-in measurement called channel power, which makes this calculation for us automatically. It's important to note that it's difficult for us to determine the data rate that the 802.11 transmitter is using simply by looking at its spectrum shape. In fact, the spectrum shape can be the same for a variety of modulation types. Another important measurement for us is spurious output, or simply, is our radio transmitting information outside of its channel? We can clearly see the spectrum adjacent to the operating channel in this display here. Slide 27. In this display, we have a spectrum display as well as a spectrogram. Like the spectrum display, the spectrogram has low frequency on the left and high frequency on the right. On the y-axis, however, we have time. Newest time is at the bottom and oldest time is at the top. Color in the spectrogram represents power. Red is hot or very large and black is cold or very low. What makes a spectrogram so useful is that we can see non-randomness in the noise floor much more clearly than using just a basic spectrum analyzer display. In the spectrogram, we're looking at more than one signal acquisition. In fact, with SignalView PC, we can store and play back all of the acquisitions that we collect. The MDO from Tektronix is not a sweeping spectrum analyzer. That means we can capture all of the activity in the span in a single acquisition. When we make a spectrogram of this data, it becomes one of the best ways for us to characterize how much interference might be occurring in and around our channel of operation. This measurement is called a spectrum emission mask, or SEM. The 802.11 specifications clearly define the adjacent channel power limits. In this example, we're looking at the SEM for an 802.11 AC transmitter. In the SEM, all of the energy from the transmitter must fall below the shaded area. Normally, a test house will only look at the lowest, middle, and highest frequencies of operation. However, it is good practice to test all channels. This is one area where people tend to spend a lot of time, optimizing their transmitter output power so that they pass SEM testing. Here we have an RF power versus time measurement on another 802.11 AC signal. You can quite clearly see the difference between the header and payload portions of the signal. In any bursted radio application, we need to be careful how fast we turn the radio on and off, because it can cause spurs. In the PVT, here we get to look at channel power as well as burst length. We can then zoom in on the rising and falling edges to examine the turn on and turn off times. When we need to see inside a Wi-Fi signal, then we need to use the vector signal analysis functions of SignalView PC. The 802.11 standards present some measurement challenges because there's a wide variety of modulation types used in the payload. To simplify the setup, once you've entered the 802.11 standard type and emission bandwidth, SignalView is able to directly read the header information and provide the correct payload analysis. In this example, we have a constellation diagram on the left and a signal quality summary on the right. The constellation diagram is very useful when we're troubleshooting connectivity issues. If the transmit signal has a low amount of error, then we know that the points in the display should have very, very tight, small groupings. The spacing between each grouping should be consistent, and we should see a very uniform square representation of all of the groupings. In the right pane, we see a summary of all of the information we've collected about the burst. A power summary, a frequency error summary, and a signal quality summary for the various portions of the burst being decoded. In the previous slides, we were looking at only a single measurement. SignalView PC gives us the ability to make all of these measurements in a single acquisition. 
because we have domain correlation, we can add a marker to any one of the time domain displays and have it automatically track in the frequency domain. Pre-scanning your equipment under test for EMI, EMC issues is one of the most challenging measurements that people need to perform. Here we're looking at an EMI scan for a product which goes up to the maximum frequency of 6 gigahertz. It's important to note that there may be circumstances when you need to go much higher in frequency and Tektronix has spectrum analyzer solutions available all the way up to 26 gigahertz. For EMI pre-scanning we need to set up a scanning profile. The profile includes start frequency, stop frequency, resolution bandwidth type, video bandwidth type, detector type, as well as the absolute limits of the measurement itself. In addition, we may also need to compensate for any gain or loss in the cabling and antenna that we're using. All of these features are supported in the spurious scan measurement of SignalView PC. To make the setup of SignalView PC easier for novice users, Tektronix has created a Wi-Fi pre-compliance wizard. The wizard provides step-by-step -step instructions to configure the measurements. Once the user has specified the country of operation, the channel, the 802.11 mode, and the signal bandwidth, the wizard automatically configures SignalView to make measurements. The wizard goes through the process of measuring four aspects of the Wi-Fi signal, channel power, occupied bandwidth, spectrum emission mask, and spurious emissions are all measured. For each test, a pass-fail is provided, as well as the measurement margin. All of the measurement data can be directly exported to a CSV file. There is much more information available about Wi-Fi testing from our website. We have a series of application notes, as well as short videos which demonstrate how to analyze a Wi-Fi signal. Specific regulatory information for North America can be found at the websites for either the Federal Communications Commission or Industry Canada. Your time is important, and we thank you for attending our webinar. Please feel free to contact your local Tektronic All right, thanks, Rob. Now, a few of you have already submitted questions, so we're going to jump right in in a minute. You can still submit a question by typing it into the question window on the side of your screen, hitting the Submit button, and uh, we'll get to it. While we're answering your questions, we'd like to ask you to complete a feedback form that will be sent as a pop-up. Now, if you're blocking pop-ups, you may still access the survey through the icon above the slides. Okay, question one. Um, I'm interested in performing this same type of testing for Bluetooth. Uh, does SignalView support that? Well, the short answer is that SignalView supports some of the Bluetooth emissions, but not all of them. But I would look for a forthcoming software upgrade from Tektronix to attack that. Okay. Um, looking back to slide 30, if you can call that, uh, what are the yellow dots? Slide 30 showed us the uh, signal quality measurement on an 802.11 AC signal. So on the left-hand side, we saw the constellation diagram, and that is a QAM 256 signal. So you can see the uh, basically the constellation of the OFDM payload there. The yellow dots are actually from the pilots in the payload of the OFDM signal. All right. A listener says, we've got a 36 megahertz uh, bandwidth spectrum analyzer. Can it be used for the 40 megahertz channel measurement? If it can, uh, how would you do that? Without noting the model specifically, I can't comment on the spectrum analyzer's ability to make modulation measurements. But the spectrum measurements, the spectrum emission mask, the flatness, and the standard channel power measurements should be able to be made with that spectrum analyzer. Again, depending on the model that it is. All right, Robin, let's see. Is there any extra hardware required to demodulate 802.11ac um, signals with an MDO? With an MDO 4000, we can support the narrowband Wi-Fi like 802.11p uh, all the way up to 802.11ac. Um, that platform has one gigahertz of modulation bandwidth supported with SignalView PC. Okay. Uh, talking again about SignalView PC, do you need it to make basic spectrum analyzer measurements? 
That's a, a longer question to answer. The built-in spectrum analyzer on the MDO 4000 is capable of supporting a spectrogram, uh, standard spectrum measurements, as well as occupied bandwidth and channel power measurements. The advanced measurements like spectrum emission mask and spurious sweep and uh, the record and playback require signal view PC. Okay, related to that similar question, can I make quasi quasi peak measurements with the MDO? Uh, the short answer is no. The signal view PC with the MDO 4000 supports what I call the safest detector, the peak detect. If you need a quasi-peak detect or wanted to use quasi-peak scanning, we'd have to move over to a Tektronix RSA spectrum analyzer. Okay. Well, staying with the uh, MDO 3000, uh, does it provide support for uh, uh, Wi-Fi 802.11bg? The issue with the MDO 3000 is that it's a little a less expensive little brother of the MDO 4000, and along with that comes two things. Um, there's no support for signal view PC with the MDO 3000, and the MDO 3000 itself is not vector calibrated, which means the, the intrinsic error vector magnitude of the analyzer in the MDO 3000 would be a little bit less, uh, or it would require or, or have less quality, if you will, than the MDO 4000. Having said that, with the MDO 3000, I can export the INQ data in either a MATLAB file or something called a TIQ file, which is a, a file format from Tektronix, and we could put that file into SignalView PC to at least look at the, uh, the signal. Okay, and then uh, you've answered another uh, listener's question, but. Uh, a further question about SignalView is can I remote control it? Yes. Uh, we support two or three different ways of remote controlling the SignalView PC and MDO connection. Uh, the MDO itself has remote control over uh, Skippy, which is a, a, with a Visa connection via USB or Ethernet. And SignalView PC also supports direct remote control over a VX11 interface. Okay. And... How much does an MDO 4000 cost? Well, it, the MDO, the cost of an MDO 4000 is defined by two basic things. Uh, first, the bandwidth of the oscilloscope, because it's a, it's a multi-domain instrument. We have a logic analyzer, an oscilloscope, and a spectrum analyzer built into the product. So first, we would define the oscilloscope bandwidth, uh, right from 100 megahertz all the way to 1 gigahertz. And then we define the spectrum analyzer frequency range and those choices are 3 gigahertz or 6 gigahertz. Entry-level pricing on the MDO 4000 is probably on the order of between nine and $10,000 U.S. Okay. We've run through all the questions. So uh, on that, we'll, uh, uh, on behalf of Microwaves and RF Magazine, I'd like to thank you out there in the audience for joining us today, and you, Robin, for and entertaining and elucidating um, presentation. Thanks to Tektronix for sponsoring the event for us. So to everyone, have a productive remainder of your day.